Tonight we are reading from Srimad Bhagavad Gita, chapter number two, the contents of the Gita summarized, text number 14. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Matra Sparsha Stukonteya. Shitoshna Sukadukada. Agamapayano Nityas. Tangs the Tikshashva Bharata Matrish Parshash to Konteya Shitoshna Sugadukada Agamapayano Nityas Tangs the Tikshashva Bharata Translation in purport by His Divine Grace, Srila Prabhupada. O son of Kunti, the non-permanent appearance of happiness and distress and their disappearance in due course are like the appearance and disappearance of the winter and summer seasons. They arise from sense perception, O Sayan of Bharata, and one must learn how to tolerate them without being disturbed. Purport. <clears throat> In the proper discharge of duty, one has to learn to tolerate non-permanent appearances and disappearances of happiness and distress. According to Vedic injunction, one has to take his bath early in the morning, even during the month of Magh, January, February. It is very cold at that time. But in spite of that, a man who abides by the religious principles does not hesitate to take his bath. Similarly, a woman does not hesitate to cook in the kitchen in the months of May and June, the hottest parts of the summer season. One has to execute his duty in terms of climatic, in spite of, rather, in spite of climatic inconveniences. Similarly, to fight is the religious principle of the Kshatriyas, and although one has to fight with some friend or relative, one should not deviate from his prescribed duty. One has to follow the prescribed rules and regulations of religious principles in order to rise up to the platform of knowledge, because by knowledge and devotion only can one liberate himself from the clutches of Maya illusion. The two different names of address given to Arjuna are also significant. To address him as Kaunteya signifies his great blood relations from his mother's side, and to address him as Bharata signifies his greatness from his father's side. From both sides he is supposed to have a great heritage. A great heritage brings responsibility in the matter of proper discharge of duties, Therefore, he cannot avoid fighting. <clears throat> Bande ha. Shri Guru. Shri Bada Kamala Shri Guru Vaishnavam Shcha Shri Rupa Sagrajata 
Sagana Raguna Tanvita Tam Sajiva Sadaita Sadhuta Parijana Saita Krishna Chaitanya Deva Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sagana Lalita Shri Vishakan Vitam So there's one thing for sure in this world. There's going to be the ups and the downs. Sometimes we're happy. Sometimes we're distressed. Sometimes we're wealthy. Sometimes we're impoverished. Sometimes we're healthy. Sometimes we're sick. Sometimes we are young. Sometimes we are old. You see? Constant dualities. You cannot avoid. You may try to erase the dualities by scientific progress, but you'll never erase them. This is a world of duality and it is the nature of this world. We must go through dualities. So, what do you do with the dualities? Well, you have to tolerate them, that's all. We simply have to push on executing our duty in spite of the dualities. If we let the dualities dissuade us or prevent us or stop us from executing our duties, then we degrade ourselves to the animal platform. Human life means dutiful life. That is human life. You have duty and you execute duty. Doesn't matter what the dualities are, what's going on in the dualities. It may be a pleasant situation, it may be, un it may be unpleasant, it doesn't matter. In spite of all the good, bad, beautiful and ugly trans uh, ver varieties of situations in this material existence, one continues to execute his, unfailingly continues to execute his duty to engage in the service of Krishna. And by this wonderful process of being fixed in one's duty, then one will transcend the influence of these dualities. Naprahyashat priyam prapa nodvijat prapicha priyam sthirabhujyarasang mudau brahmavidbrahmanistitaha One who does not rejoice upon obtaining something pleasant, nor lament upon obtaining something unpleasant, who is self-controlled, who is unbewildered, and who knows the science of God, is already situated in transcendence. So that's how Bhagavad Gita is telling us how to handle the dualities. When some wonderful good fortune comes your way, you don't get all excited and lose your equilibrium. You just think, well, Krishna is kind. I don't deserve this, but Krishna is very kindly giving this to me. Let me use it in his service. Not that, oh, now I can enjoy. Now I've gotten full facility to enjoy this material world. I just got a huge, huge inheritance, or I won the lottery, or I just got a raise in my job, and now let me enjoy my senses. No. One remains equipoised. Even if there's great success, material success. No. It's Krishna's arrangement somehow, so I can serve him better than some. And when things go really bad, or something horrible, just the most horrible, devastating thing happens, the devotee doesn't lament. He doesn't rejoice. When there's a great positive thing, he doesn't become overwhelmed with lamentation when something horribly bad happens. You see? 
he remains steady. Fixed in transcendental knowledge, he sees that everything is simply a result of my past karmic activities. That's my past karma, you see, is coming to me. It's all karmic. Whatever is happening is karmic. It is all happening within the laws of nature. Nothing happens by chance. Everything is happening according to my karma. And why is that karma going on? It is going on by Krishna's arrangement to help me get out of this material entanglement. That's the key. You have to utilize every experience for going forward in Krishna consciousness. You may say, well, if things are positive and I'm feeling great, it's easy then. It's easy to use that for Krishna. But what about when things are bad, some devastating thing happens to me, I get laid off, or my, I, I get informed I have terminal cancer, or you know, I'm in a car wreck and I'm, you know, I just barely escape with my life, I'm in the hospital for six weeks. I mean, what, what do you do? How do you, how do you see those in a positive, encouraging way? Is it, how can you possibly do that? One might ask. But I've, uh, I've, you have people that do the sailboats here in Wellington, right? They go out in the water and do the sailboats. Anybody get out in the water with the sailboats here? Anybody seen the sailboats out here? Yes, she's seen. seen yeah. I didn't notice any today, but... In the art of sailing, the amazing thing is you can sail with the wind... That everyone can understand. The wind's blowing, your boat goes with the wind. That's easy to understand. But you know, in sailing, you can actually go into the wind. I heard you. I always wondered how do they do that. I looked it up on Google. I look. I just went to Google. I typed in "sailing into the wind," and sure enough, you can actually sail into the wind. You can get the power from the wind and take it and go right into the wind. That's amazing. But it can be done. That's what they do. They actually do that. So in the same way, some negative situation which is working against, appears to be working against you, you can use it in your favor. And see. It appears to be completely working against me. Like now I'm defeated, this is too much, you know, I have, I'm de-energized, I'm disempowered, I'm just, there's nothing I can do, it's hopeless. No, if you if you know the art, then you can take that and use and gain energy from that to push yourself forward in Krishna consciousness. So in this way, you see the devotee, he utilizes everything for his spiritual progress. The good, the bad, the beautiful, and the ugly. He utilizes all of it to move himself forward along this pathway back to home, back to Godhead. And then, that was chapter 5, text number 20. Does anybody know the next verse? 21. It's a very nice verse, continuing on. Krishna says, Bhaya svarsheshva saktat man vinda jatmani natsukam sabrama yoga yuktat ma sukam akshayam ashnute Such a liberated soul is not attracted to material sense gratification. Why? Because he is always relishing the pleasure within. And then Krishna continues, he's saying, in this way, the self-realized soul enjoys unlimited happiness because he concentrates on the Supreme. Now here's a person, that, this is a carryover in the previous verse, here's a person, even if something unpleasant and some negative thing happens to him, He's still relishing the pleasure within. He's still relishing unple unlimited pleasure within his heart. Even though externally some very horrible thing happened to him, or some wonderful thing, it doesn't matter. Because his happiness is not on the surface. His happiness is very deep, you see. There's the internal energy and the external energy. The external energy means out there on the surface of existence the extremity. Out there in the material energy, there's the dualities, happiness and distress, heat and cold, fame and infamy, wealth and poverty, etc. That's out in the external energy that's going on. But if you get 
back into the internal energy, which is where you originally came from, you see. We are actually internal energy. Eternal, internal energy. That is our actual identity. So for us to misidentify ourselves as being part of the external energy, that causes so many problems. Is the fish internal to the ocean or external to the ocean? If he remains internal to the ocean, his life has no problems. If he tries to be external to the ocean and live on the beach, live on the dry land, he cannot be happy. You see? His position is internal to the ocean, not external to the ocean. So all we really have to do is get ourselves back into the water of Krishna consciousness and get ourselves back into this nectarian ocean, Nama Mrita Sindhu, the nectarian ocean of Krishna's holy names, Krishna Nama Mrita Sindhu. You see? We simply have to get back into that position. And then Sukham Akshayam Ashnute, he enjoys unlimited happiness. As a traveling preacher, I can see so many dualities. Sometimes we 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 receive very nicely. Sometimes we're not very received very nicely. It happens, you know. It's part of the dualities of material existence. But you don't use it all to your advantage. Sometimes we give good advice and it's accepted. Sometimes we give advice and it's rejected. Sometimes we give very good instructions. And it's rejected. Devotees, no, they say, no, I don't want to take that advice. Even though we give them the proper advice, they don't want to take it. But our duty is to, is, as, as the, those of us who have been trained up by Srila Prabhupada, you see, we understand that we're a dying number on this planet. Every day, practically, another, every few days at least, another Prabhupada disciple. I mean, they're regularly leaving their bodies. You know, not, you don't even hear about it. I just found a dear God brother of mine that joined the same time I did. He left his body a year and a half ago. I didn't know. Divya Hari Prabhu. Uh, the Prabhupada disciples are gradually disappearing from this planet. And we were trained by Srila Prabhupada. What is the proper standard of Krishna consciousness? So, as long as we're here, it's our duty to train all the, the younger devotees in what is the actual standards that are pleasing to Srila Prabhupada. And sometimes people, they take that instruction, they say, yes, very good, thank you. Sometimes they, they say, yes, 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 and then they just ignore it. They, they think they know better. You see, they think they know better than what the, uh, the, the training that's coming down from Srila Prabhupada. Well, that's because the duality, you see. <laughs> So I think, well, since sometimes my advice is not taken, therefore I should just give it up? No. My duty is to pass on, until my last dying breath, to pass on to the people of this planet what Prabhupada has given to me. That's my duty. Now whether you all take it or not, that's up to you. That's up to you. But my duty remains the same. As long, see, my duty is not affected by the dualities of being accepted or rejected and when I give instructions. It's not, not, it's not affected by your acceptance or rejection. My duty is to simply give you what Prabhupada has given to me. That's, all. that's it. And that's my success. And then Prabhupada is pleased with me. Prabhupada gives the example of someone who's beyond the dualities a salesman is on a salary. He just does his duty for the company and he gets a salary, that's all. You did your work sincerely, so here's your salary. He may make a million dollars worth of sales one day and the next day he doesn't sell anything. You see? But he's, he's doing his duty. So he's, he know, he's doing his duty. He's approaching the people. He's offering the product and the, according to his best sales 
te uh, techniques that he knows from years of experience. And he just, um, he just keeps doing his duty. And he's not worried about it. He tries for the result, but he, he's, he knows that he's going to be compensated for making that sincere effort. So in the same way, the devotee is, is situated beyond the dualities. He knows, I'm going to make my sincere effort to pass on to the people what Prabhupada has given me, that's all. They may take it, that's their good fortune. They may not take it, that is their misfortune. But my good fortune is to always continue giving to everyone what Prabhupada has given me, that's all. That's my good fortune. And if you want the good fortune, then you can take it. If you don't want the good fortune, you can say, well, who are you? He's some upstart character from the U.S. You see? <laughs> One can see, you know, in a mundane way, you see. Or one can see in the transcendental way. So in this way, um, <clears throat> We have to learn how to become transcendental to the dualities of this material existence and carry on with our duty to Srila Prabhupada, to our spiritual masters, uh, to the previous acharyas, etc., etc., etc. In this way, Krishna will become very pleased with us and we will become fully qualified to go back to home, back to Godhead, and enter into those sublime transcendental pastimes of that amazing person, Lord Sri Krishna, and his associates, his eternal associates, the Nitya Siddhas. Nitya Siddha Sangha. Let's see, he is awaiting us. And we take this process very seriously. We will go to sleep. If you give your life fully in the service of Guru and Krishna, without any consideration of the duality, just pushing forward with your duty in all circumstances, then the, in the final moment of your life in this body, you will simply go to sleep and you wake up with Krishna. That's all. And all the run, it'll be just like a dream you were having. It won't be so important, all the struggles of material life, it won't be so important, it was just a dream. It wasn't really me anyway, it was just my body. It was just a covering. It wasn't actually the Atma. It was a covering. It was in the body, you see, goes through the dualities. But, and the mind also. But the devotee is actually situated beyond the dualities. He's already situated beyond the dualities. When you fully awaken your Krishna consciousness, actually you can even do that before you leave your body. You can actually situate yourself in perfect transcendental consciousness even while you're here within the body. You don't have to wait for death. You can do it now. You can sincerely strive for it right now and, and you can this way you can as quickly as possible uh, move up the progressive uh, pathway from Shraddha to Prema. We had a whole retreat in, in Govinda Valley uh, around Christmas weekend on how to go from Shraddha to Prema, you see, how to achieve the perfection. On the Prema stage, you can see Krishna. You're within this world, you're within this body, you can actually see Krishna. You can talk with him, you can ask him questions, you can touch him, you can eat with him, Prabhupada said. You can dance with him. Krishna is personally present for you. You can see him and you can reciprocate with him in that stage. Even within Prabhupada said, I heard the, the lecture last night and we were going on my MP3 player. Prabhupada said, even within this body, you can do this. So you don't have to wait for death. You can try for it right now. And Prabhupada wrote me a letter when I was a young brahmachari. I mean, I was like 24, 23 years old brahmachari at the time. And he told me, maybe, maybe 25. <clears throat> no, it's 1972, so... Yeah, but... 21 is 4... 24. I'm not 24 age. He said, um, he said, if I've, been, if I've been engaged myself in devotional service 24 hours a day with full sincerity of attitude, that Krishna would personally reveal himself to me and answer all of my questions. Can you imagine? 
And Prabhupada knows what he's talking about because he's able to do that. Prabhupada can actually sit and see Krishna directly in front of him and ask Krishna questions and get the questions answered directly from Krishna. <clears throat> so Prabhupada told me that I could do it too. Simply, I had to be 24 hours engaged in devotional service, with, he said, with full sincerity of attitude. So, how do we become sincere then? That's the question. How do we really become perfectly sincere? One devotee said, well, I'm not sincere. I said, well, are you, are you saying that sincerely? <laughs> this is a Madhaji in South Africa. She answered it very cleverly. She said, well, not as sincere. I'm not answering it as sincerely as I should, that I'm not sincere. She's very intelligent, Madhaji. She said this time, I'm not, I say that I'm not sincere, but I'm not saying that with full sincerity. So we have to, sincerity means that, you know, I'm genuine. I, I truly want to be a devotee. You see, I genuinely want to be a devotee. I really do. I'm sincere about being a devotee. I know I have so many faults right now. I'm lusty. I'm angry. I'm greedy. I'm lazy. I got every bad quality in the book. <laughs> but I really want to become a devotee. I really want to get over all of this stuff and wake, wake in my Krishna consciousness. I really do. I'm sincere about getting out of this horrible mentality I'm in right now, you see. That's sincerity. And just maintain that sincerity through all circumstances and Krishna will reward us, you see. We just have to maintain that sincerity and Krishna will reward us for that. And if, we, and if we may, that sincerity is maintained, as Prabhupada told me, if we can get to the point where that sincerity is just, you know, it's 100% sincerity 24 hours a day, that's when Krishna says, okay, here I am. I'm very pleased with your attitude, and now I re I'm now revealing myself to you. you see. We have to qualify ourselves to, to them by sincere service. So I can ask now if there's any question. Yes, Gurudev. Gurudev, <clears throat> could you kindly give an example from your personal life mm. when something bad encouraged you? Okay. <clears throat> well, it's how to get encouragement even when there's a bad thing. Is another way of saying it. Well, there's certain, um, I personally, I do suffer certain things. I have a chronic ear problem, for example. A very chronic ear problem going back for about 50 years, I guess. I've been suffering and it just gets worse and worse and worse. So how do I take encouragement? How do I get energized by that, you see? Well, I have to see that I've done some sinful thing in a previous lifetime. And now Krishna is giving me this as a means of purifying my consciousness to help me surrender to Him. So that, and I, in that way I take, I, I take, take it as, uh, I get energized by seeing it in that way. And Krishna is blessed, this is a blessing from Krishna. I also see, well, I see that, well, it's, it's not as bad as it could have been. I mean, it's not term, it's not life-threatening. I'm thinking other devotees are leaving their body. We all suffer various reactions. From, even after initiation, you still get some token reaction for past misdeeds. Like 1%, something, you know, some small number. Of it. We do suffer, we, even after initiation, we get token reactions. So, I'm thinking, well, I could have gotten in some way that's life-threatening, and would, you know, would, would kill me, kill the body, see. But I'm getting my reactions in a way that in no way threaten my health, my overall physical well-being. So in that way I take it as, a, that's another way of seeing it in a positive way. 
So I just, it's a matter of trying to go a little deeper and see just beyond the, the level of um, pain and pleasure and try to see that um, somehow Krishna has given me this for my benefit and have faith in that principle. It's not easy, but uh, if you really, if you realize it's, I have no choice really but to do that. I have to see it as Krishna's mercy, otherwise it'll, it'll be, it'll, my mind will never become peaceful, never become peaceful. I have to see this as Krishna's mercy for me, to help me uh, come to him. I mentioned one god brother, one very dear god brother of mine about this, he said, Krishna is preparing you for your spiritual body. <laughs> We have to see everything in a very positive way. Never become d dis depressed or discouraged by it. There is always there's a positive, positive energy behind every single th every single thing that happens to us because ultimately it's all going under Krishna's direction. I mean, even in mundane, even in the mundane material world. Some years ago, I was doing a. Um, a business to support our preaching activities. So I subscribed to one magazine, Success Magazine. And the biggest success stories that this magazine gave about so many people who hit the big time were people who were down and out. They were in the most, they were they reduced to complete poverty. They you know, they were living out of their car or sleeping on their sister's living room couch. I mean, they couldn't even afford to rent an apartment anymore. There were so many stories of people who became ultra successful from completely, you know, a failure position. And Prabhupada, in this connection, mentions him, uh, that failure is the pillar of success. Prabhupada says, especially in spiritual life, failure is the pillar of success. So if one learns to see failure as the sees the hand of Krishna in one's failure, then that gives one that failure is actually, actually is, a, is a springboard that you can utilize for success. It's like the diver. He wants to go this way, but how does he he goes down on the springboard? Because that springboard then will, will give him a bounce back that gives him more power to go even higher. He goes the opposite direction of the way he wants to go. Um, you've seen the divers on the diving board? Yeah. They go down on the diving board and that gives them a spring action to go even higher. You see? So if one takes the, the reverse situation uh, and I sees the hand of Krishna in that reverse situation, that reverse situation becomes a springboard which pushes one even higher. So I've had to, I've been, Krishna has forced me to cultivate this vision of my, you know, this handicap of my hearing for the last, um, ever since I was about 15, 15 or 16 years old, now I'm, or it's almost 50 years now I've had it, you see. It's big, big problem in ears, pain and deafness and so many problems, constant ringing. So one, one just learns to see the, 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 the hand of the Lord in everything and appreciate. Somehow Krishna has blessed me. Tate nukam pam susumikshamano Bunjana ek vatma makam prakapa makam was it? Tate nukam pam susamikshamano bunjana e vatma makam makapam tadvagma povir with a dam namaste jivete yo mukti pade sadaya bak. My dear Lord, those devotees who are always awaiting your causeless mercy to be bestowed upon them, who continue to suffer the reactions for their past misdeeds, continually, gratefully offering you respectful obeisances from within the innermost cores of their hearts are certainly eligible candidates for liberation. Indeed, it has become their rightful claim. So they just think, I, Krishna's burning off my 
past sins by giving me these reactions now. Instead of thinking, why are you doing this to me, Krishna? Don't you know I'm your devotee? Why are you doing this to me? I'll teach you a good lesson. I'll become atheist. Is it? They do that. They say, God did this to me. Now I'm atheist. I'm going to teach God a lesson. Give God a slap in the face. You see? That's atheist, you see. But the devotee, they say, oh, this is Krishna's kindness. Kunti Devi was feeling like that. Vipada shanti tashashvat tatra tatra jagadgaro bhavanam darshanam yatsyadapana bhavadarshanam. She told Daya to Krishna. She had spent 13 years living in the forest, horrible situations, man eating rakshasas, no comfortable places to lay down at night, uh, you know, an attempt to burn them to death in the palace made of shellac. So many austerities she went through living in the forest, and now. They the the uh, they regained the palace. They're now the the rulers of the world. Everything's wonderful, and she's saying, Krishna, Krishna is leaving for Dwarka now. Everything is all the problems are solved, and Krishna is going away. She's saying, Krishna, let those calamities come back, because when those calamities are there, I can do nothing but take shelter of you and see you. By I see you by taking shelter of you. And when I see you, I no longer will see birth and death. So please, please give me more calamities, my Lord. She was begging for them. <clears throat> she's, she's saying, calamities are my greatest good fortune in Krishna consciousness. So please give me more and more calamities. So we may, we may not be able to heartfully pray like Kunti Devi. But at least when the calamities come, we shouldn't become... We should try to see how the hand of Krishna is acting in that way. There's a positive reason for everything. One has to have faith in that principle. There's a positive Krishna conscious reason for everything that happens to us at every minute. Somehow we just got to have, we have to have faith in that principle. And be in a mood, a constant attitude of gratitude towards the Supreme Lord in all circumstances, in everything that comes to us. The austerity of suffering reverses, purifies us, and makes us more qualified. It's like there was, uh, for many years I faced very heavy politics in our movement. There were certain devotees who wanted to prevent me from becoming an initiating spiritual master. All kinds of, it was really uh, like dirty politics. Lying, double talk. It really was disgusting. But I saw that actually Krishna was just preparing, he was actually just putting me through all that to help me become even more qualified to be a spiritual master when I finally did get the, the blessings from the GBC. He made it difficult for me to get the blessings to become an initiating guru. So when I finally got it, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take it cheaply. What I had, the hell I had to go through to get the blessings to be an initiating spiritual master in this movement. Many devotees would never have done it. They would, many of them wouldn't. They left the movement because of it. They left the movement because of the politics. But I, just, I stuck with it because I know this is Prabhupada wanted me to stay and whatever may have come, I had to just stay with this movement. So that helped me. That was to my advantage, actually, that difficulty I went through. Helped me to become more qualified to do the service for Prabhupada, you see, taking disciples. That's another example. Any other question? Yes. Uh, just a question related to your comments regarding austerities and Krishna putting you through these situations for uh, something much more positive which he has planned for you. 
I am quoting this from chapter 88 of the Krishna book. Okay. The specific reference to this subject that if Krishna loves you, that's the reason he brings you into these awkward situations. You are left with nothing but to honor. Impossible? Pardon? You said impossible situation? A painful situation. Painful, okay. Painful. Right. So that you are left with no other option but to fall on his feet. Right. And the next line is very important and it says, it may have nothing to do, that pain may have nothing to do with your past karma. It may not. That's interesting. Yes. So, are we not seeing a contradiction here that pain may not be because of past karma? Um, no, it, actually, it may appear to be a contradiction, Prabhu, but actually it's not a contradiction. What you have to realize is there's two different energies that are working. There's the material energy where everything, is, every, absolutely everything is karmic. Everything. Within the material energy, every single thing is karmic. There's nothing, not even a slight deviation from karma at any level happens. But once you're under the spiritual energy, then Krishna, he can, he can remove... He can take away pain you were supposed to get if that's favorable for your Krishna consciousness or give you pain you weren't supposed to get if that is favorable for your Krishna consciousness. You understand? I didn't get the last point, please. Krishna can put you in a difficulty even though you karmically weren't supposed to have that difficulty just to help you become more Krishna conscious or more successful in your preaching also. That, in other words, this material energy is completely on the law of karma, but the spiritual energy is, is, is beyond the law of karma. That's just Krishna's arrangement. He's pers now you're getting personal care from Krishna. You were orchestrated by the material energy, now you're being orchestrated by Krishna himself directly. And he's going to do whatever is... Now, as you're awakening your love for him, he's reciprocating with that and helping to draw you closer and closer to him. And he may sometimes put you in a distressful condition you didn't even deserve just to help you come even closer to him. You understand? So that there's, one, there's the material energy which is purely karmic and the spiritual energy which is beyond karma. It's simply Krishna's, it's Krishna's reciprocating with you and trying to draw you ever, ever closer to him and closer to him. Did the cowherd boys deserve to be surrounded by a forest fire after they came back from the Kaliya pastime? Did they deserve it karmically? No. So why did they have to suffer a near-death near experience being surrounded by a, a forest fire in Vrindavan Forest? Why did they have to do that? They didn't deserve it from their karma, their pure devotees. But that forest fire was there simply so they, they could increase their feelings of love for Krishna. All they could do was say, Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. In complete helplessness, they're calling out for the Lord. And he's so happy to see that complete helplessness in the hearts of the devotees. They're just calling out to him. Krishna loves that kind of, of surrender of the devotees. But they, their love becomes more and more intense. Their feelings of, in, of dependence become more and more intense. Krishna feels he's very much loved to have that kind of reciprocation with his devotees. <clears throat> so sometimes Krishna will give. If you're act, if you're within the, if you're actually coming to the point of developing your love for Krishna, he will give you sometimes pain you don't even deserve. Ultimate the laws of karma just to speed up your, your spiritual advancement. Because he's so pleased that now you're coming to him. He, want, he doesn't want to wait. He wants to accelerate your progress. So he gives you some distress to help you become that much quicker to him. You see what I'm saying? Does it make sense? The steps which were given in that particular incident were, he makes you penniless, so your relations don't know you. He takes your family away from you. To make you surrender. Absolutely. Why such an austerity? Is there no better way with Krishna to call you? Can you repeat what he said? He said that um, there's a verse that it says that 
Krishna takes away when he... <laughs> oh, yeah, that verse, yeah, there's a verse that says, when Krishna shows special mercy upon his devotees, he takes away all of his material attachments. Yes. Yeah. So he yeah. says there is a better way, rather than putting the devotee, Krishna... Is there a better way than that? Yeah. Well, there's three different levels, Prabhu. <clears throat> For someone who is completely materialistic, you know, money, 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 sweeter than honey, you know. <laughs> they come to the temple and they pray for money and Krishna gives them money to help increase their faith in Krishna, you see, to bring them closer. But there's someone who realizes this material sense of gratification is not where it's at, pure devotional service is where it's at, now I want to become a pure devotee but they're still hanging on to their material attachments. Then Krishna rips all the material attachments away. Okay, I, I, now you're laid off from your job. Your car got repossessed. You know, I'm, I'm going to make put you in a helpless position. You want to be a pure devotee because you're holding on to your material attachments. Now I'll help you get free of those material attachments by ripping them all away. You see? But then the third person... He's completely detached from this material world, but he just wants to be a pure devotee. Then Krishna gave him unlimited facilities, unlimited wealth, unlimited power, unlimited fame. You see? So there's three levels. Materially attached person, the person who's in the middle, and the person who's purely spiritual. The material person, he can give, he can give material facility. The one who's purely spiritual will give him unlimited material facility. The one who's in the middle will take it away. So if you don't want to get it taken away, it's too late to be in the first position, you already know better. <laughs> now you just got to be, you just have to pray for pure bhakti. And my dear Lord, please help me realize that whatever I have is it's not my property, it's all yours. Bhakti, you know, at the course that I'm working to maintain Krishna's household, not my own household. You see, he's, this wife, these children, this, these are Krishna's property. I'm working this job for the British government, you see as magistrate, simply to maintain Krishna's also. So if you'll purify your vision and always beat down that tendency, that envious tendency to think, I am the proprietor, you see. You beat it down with the sort of knowledge, seriously cultivate bhakti at every minute, then you'll be amazed how Krishna reciprocates. Any other questions? Is there a better way Krishna can do that rather than putting the person into a um, uh, tormentable situation? Like Krishna always does everything the better way. <laughs> <laughs> According to the patient, the doctor gives the proper medicine. He always gives the best medicine, not better, best. Krishna gives the best medicine for every single person to come out of the quagmire of material existence. Krishna will always, not better, Krishna will always give the very best medicine to every person. I don't know why he's given me an al a heavy allergy for the last week. It's incredibly heavy eye allergies. My eyes, my eyes are burning like fire, itching like unbelievable, constantly for, the, for a whole week. Somehow or other, Krishna, this is, I don't know why Krishna did it, but he, he's, for some reason, I'm going through this. It's part of my purification. Just got to think, oh, Krishna, I don't know why you're doing it, but all right. <laughs> there must be a purpose of purifying my consciousness, you see. Is, is there a better way, Krishna, for you to... Do? This is actually the best thing for me right now. Even though I may not feel like it, it's the best thing for me right now. What I'm going through by Krishna's arrangement, it's the best thing for me. I can't understand it, but I accept it. Krishna always puts me in the best situation for my preaching and for my advancement both. He always does. He always puts me in the... Because I want to preach, I want to spread this movement. I sinc very sincerely want to see that this whole world will become Krishna conscious before I leave my body. I really want it. Like anything, I have a passionate desire that this whole world will become Krishna conscious before I leave this body. So I know Krishna is going to... will reciprocate with this desire of mine. And I know he's putting me in a situation, the, always the best situation for my preaching and the best situation for my advance, personal advancement. I have complete faith that Krishna is always putting me in the very best situation 
even though I may not feel like it. <laughs> I know it's a fib. I know it's a fib. So the mind says, this is no good. But my intelligence I can understand, actually this is the best. This is the best of all situations I'm in. Right now is the very best of all situations I can be in. Even though the mind can't, can't understand it. <laughs> so anyway, I think we'll go ahead and stop here. Uh, we'll have a Bhagavatam class tomorrow and then the Sunday Feast Lecture. So we encourage everyone to, um, to, to try to, let's, let's try to pack the temple room. Um, I remember last time we came on the week, on Saturday, there was a full temple room on Saturday. And what happened? Was I not advertised? Or? No, it wasn't. Huh? It was advertised. It was advertised. So most of the devotees gone out to India. Probably, so. I mean, the devotees are out of uh, in India. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is the time to it's go to India. Period, so. This is a holiday period. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a time to head out for this place and that place, yeah. Okay. So let's, let's, let's make the best use and, and get every possible person we can here for tomorrow's uh, program. Thank you very much. Srila Baba Padaki Jai. Srila Baba Padaki Jai.